So, my friend told me the other day that he was cured from hemophilia. To this, I told him, coagulations. <laughs> and have you ever wondered how phlebotomists eat their lunch? Well, they eat it on platelets. <laughs> Salutations and greetings, everybody. Ryan here. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we're discussing von Willebrand disease. I encourage you to smash that subscribe button and like and share button because I'm sure you're going to enjoy this content, right? God bless you. Thanks for joining me. Here's an outline. We're going to be discussing a clinical case and then be looking at von Willebrand disease. Key points, guys, front and center, the headlining key points about what you need to know succinctly. Then we're going to break it down in terms of an introduction patient presentation, a differential diagnosis, diagnostic evaluation and investigations, treatment and management, prognosis and complications. We're going to end up talking about the Bible. This is quite a lengthy stem for our clinical case, right? So let's get stuck in, guys. You are consulted after an episode of postpartum hemorrhage in a 24-year-old woman. This has been her first pregnancy and she successfully delivered a healthy child at 39 weeks and 4 days. The child weighed a healthy 3.2 kilograms and the delivery was uncomplicated, spontaneous vaginal delivery. The uterine fundus had contracted appropriately, but over the course of the next 24 hours, the patient has more than one liter of bloody discharge. That's not normal. She has felt increasingly weak and has lightheadedness and standing, probably on account of postural hypotension. Heart rate is 126, so she's tacky. Uh, blood pressure 92 over 50, so she's definitely... Uh, hypotensive, she appears pale, her pulses are thready. Cardiovascular exam shows a regular tachy. Hemoglobin prior to delivery was 9.2 gram per deciliter. It is now 6 gram per deciliter, so she's losing substantial amounts of blood. Her INR is 1.1, which is okay, and her PTT is 42.5 seconds already. Upon further questioning, the patient describes one other episode of prolonged oral bleed when she was a child at the age of 7. At that time, she had a cap placed on her tooth and subsequently experienced significant bleeding. She bruises easily but has never had hemarthrosis. Uh -huh. She says that she stopped playing soccer in grade school due to large bruises after minor injuries that were painful and embarrassing to her. She has had no other surgery. She's taking iron supplements and prenatal vitamins. She has no allergies. She has a family history of excessive bleeding after a surgical procedure and a father from whom she is now estranged. What do you suspect is the cause of the patient's illness? Hmm, nice to ask, eh? Is it A, an acquired inhibitor of coagulation? Is it B, factor 8 deficiency? Is it C, factor 9 deficiency? Is it D, surreptitious use of or ingestion of anticoagulant? Or is it E, von Willebrand disease? Guys, let's talk. Key points. Von Willebrand disease is a hereditary deficiency of our beloved von Willebrand factor, which causes platelet destruction, right? Bleeding tendency is usually mild. Screening tests show a normal platelet count and possibly a slightly prolonged partial thromboplastin time. Diagnosis is based on low levels of a von Willebrand factor antigen and abnormal restocetin cofactor activity. Interesting. Treatment involves control of the bleeding with replacement therapy, which could be virally activated, intermediate purity factor 8 concentrate, or desmopressin. Guys, von Willebrand disease, as we know, is a group of disorders of the von Willebrand factor, a protein that mediates platelet adhesion to damaged endothelium to form a platelet plaque. So von Willebrand factor is critical in primary hemostasis. It forms the bridge between subendothelial collagen, which is exposed, and the platelets. That's important in platelet binding and activation. It is a defect of primary hemostasis because it's involved in platelet aggregation. Acquired defects, often iatrogenic or secondary to some kind of medical illness, are much more common than inherited defects, right? The most common inherited bleeding disorder is the claim to fame of von Willebrand disease. It is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Clinical manifestations are highly variable, right? Let's look at etiology, epidemiology, and risk factors, guys. So, von Willebrand factor, as we know, is a large multimedic protein stored in platelets and endothelial cells. As we said, it mediates adhesion of platelets to sites of vascular injury via platelet glycoprotein 1b. Right. Von Willebrand disease may result from congenital absence of von Willebrand factor or abnormalities in its structure and function. Von Willebrand factor also functions, this is the second claim to fame, 
So firstly, we said it's the bridge that binds your subendothelial collagen to the platelets, right, via glycoprotein 1b. The second claim to fame is that it is a carrier protein for coagulation of factor 8, which is synthesized by the endothelium, not by the liver, hence protecting it from rapid clearance from the plasma. The absence of vulnerable factor creates a secondary deficiency of coagulation factor 8. Type, so there's three different types of von Willebrand disease. Type 1 is the most common, which is 80% of cases, in which von Willebrand factor is structurally and functionally normal, but just reduced in quality, a quantity rather, sorry. Usually results in mild to moderate clinical disease, right? Then type 2 von Willebrand disease is a situation in which von Willebrand factor is qualitatively abnormal, thus defective, and has multiple variant forms, 2A, 2B, 2M, 2N. Type 2B is associated with thrombocytopenia. Type 3 is the most severe, in which there is absence of von Willebrand factor, so no detectable von Willebrand factor exists, resulting in markedly decreased coagulation factor 8 activity, which may look like and smell like hemophilia. It affects approximately 1 in 200 to 500 Americans, which is about 1 to 3 percent of the gender population. Not that uncommon, guys. Typically inherited in autosomal dominant manner. Males and females are equally affected, as well as all racial groups are affected, righty? So here is a beautiful representation of um, plate plug formation. Let's just get my pen in there. Okay, so here we are, primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. The first step is primary hemostasis, right? Uh, in which the usual sequence of events is to some degree of endothelial injury. There's exposure of subendothelial collagen and a vertebral factor then bridges the collagen to the platelets. So we have plated adhesion, then we have plated activation, plated aggregation, plated adhesion, plated activation, plated aggregation. And the net result of this is the formation of a uh, platelet plug, right? But it's not a very stable platelet plug. We still have to stabilize those cross-linked fibrin fibers, right? And the, this initial step is simply to prevent blood loss, right? So it's a kind of an unstable uh, platelet plug. And that's where the secondary hemostasis comes in. There's a variety of the cascade of coagulation factors, that each being a proenzyme activating an enzyme downstream. And the net result is to reinforce the fibrin mesh to form a stable uh, secondary hemostatic platelet plug. Okay, so here is a beautiful diagram from Harrison's and we're looking at platelet activation and thrombosis. So platelets circulate in an inactive form in the vasculature. Here's our inactive uh, platelet site. Damage to endothelium, there we go, or external stimuli activates platelets that adhere to the exposed subendothelial von Willebrand factor and collagen. Now, this adhesion leads to activation of the platelet, conformational change, and the synthesis and release of our beloved friends, thromboxin A2, serotonin, and adenosine diphosphate ADP. Platelet stimuli cause conformational change in the platelet integrin glycoprotein GP2B3A receptor, leading to a high affinity binding of fibrinogen and formation of a stable platelet thrombus. So here we have some degree of endothelial injury, exposure of our subendothelial collagen, platelets come through and bind to the subendothelial collagen, and this is where von Willebrand factor acts at the point of binding between the platelet and the subendothelial collagen. All right, these platelets then become activated. They release thromboxin A2, ADP, and serotonin, which causes more platelet activation, platelet aggregation, right, and adhesion. And so we have the formation of a platelet plug. But we need coagulation factors to make this a stable uh, platelet plug. So here is basically a summary of our coagulation pathways. Specific coagulation pathways are responsible for the conversion of soluble plasma fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. And that is the net result of our coagulation. Right? We want our fibrinogen to form fibrin and this to be nice, cross-linked, compact, stable uh, hemostatic platelet plug to be formed. Right? So this process occurs by a series of linked reactions in which the enzymatically active product subsequently converts the downstream inactive protein into an active serine protease. In addition, the activation of thrombin leads to stimulation of platelets. So usual study, guys, is an existing pathway and an intrinsic pathway and a common pathway, right? So if darling, talking about the intrinsic pathway, we start off with factor 12. If you're talking about the uh, uh, extrinsic pathway, we're starting off a tissue factor and factor 7, right? But they both are going to lead to the formation of the stable hemostatic platelet plug, right? So we have uh, factor 12. So let's start off with the intrinsic pathway. Factor 12 is activated to uh, factor 12A. And here we have high molecular weight kininogen and precalicrane, right? And factor that converts factor 11 to factor 11A. 
uh, and eventually um, we have the formation of factor 9, and factor 9 becomes activated factor 9, and that results in the activation of 10 to 10A. This is a critical step, okay? And we're coming in via the extrinsic pathway 7 to 7A and exposure to tissue factor via activated factor 7 does the same thing, right? Remember that 9 uh, activated factor 9 causes the activation of factor 10 via phospholipid and calcium, right? All right, so factor 10 is a critical step because in the, pro in, in the presence of phospholipid and calcium, activated factor 10 converts inactive prothrombin into active thrombin, right? And factor 5 to 5A also mediates this process in 8 to 8A. This is, remember we said that von Willebrand factor is a carrier for factor 8, which is produced in the endothelium, right? And once we have thrombin, that converts fibrinogen into fibrin, and we have a nice, stable, compact, reliable, dependable hemostatic secondary platelet plug. Thank you so much, guys. So here we're talking about von Willebrand disease, and this is a fun illustration from makecomic.com. Thank you to Mr. Jorge Muniz and company. Von Willebrand disease, as we follow this, is the most common inheritance of bleeding disorder. Yes, autosomal dominant inheritance. Patients may present with mucocutaneous bleeding, and that's a tip-off that this is not a factor problem. This is a problem of primary hemostasis. So they have epistaxis, they have easy bruising, they have menorrhagia, they have GI bleeding. They don't have bleeding into muscle and joints. No hemarthrosis, right? Because that's the the, the poster presentation for a factor problem. Von Willebrand factor acts as a carrier protein for factor 8 in the plasma, we know this. It also helps with platelet adhesion and aggregation to damage in the ethereum, we know this. It comes in three flavors, type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is a deficiency of von Willebrand factor, the most common type, right? So it's there, but it's reduced in quantity, like your phone that is low on battery needs to be charged. And the treatment of this, therefore, intuitively, is desmopressin or cryoprecipitate. But in type 2 von Willebrand disease, the problem is you've got von Willebrand factor, but it's kind of like hyperactive, <laughs> like these guys. They're busy eating bowling balls here, right? It's abnormal or dysfunctional, right? Whereas in type 3, which is the most severe, is where von Willebrand factor is absent, completely. Like, you're calling for von Willebrand in the class, you say, von Willebrand, von Willebrand, von Willebrand, and nobody there, so it's absent. So intuitively now, the treatment for type 2 and type 3 disease is factor 8, concentrate, or cryoprecipitate. Guys, how do patients present? So patients with von Willebrand disease usually present with delayed bleeding or superficial bleeding due to failure to form a nice stable platelet plug. In the skin, it will manifest with petechiae, purpura, easy bruising. In the mucosa, we have gingival bleeding, especially with toothbrushing, epistaxis, gastrointestinal bleeds, genital urinary bleeds in the way of menorrhagia, right? Post-operative bleeding as well, typical presentation after tooth extraction or tonsillectomy. Differential diagnosis, guys, it can be an acquired coagulation disorder like disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, ITP, liver disease, vitamin K deficiency, could be leukemia, aplastic anemia, connective tissue disease, qualitative platelet dysfunction, right? For instance, glansmus thrombiasthenia, or it could be uremia causing it, um, Bernard Soulier disease. Deficiency of coagulation factors 8, 9, 10, and 12, platelet aggregation disorders in the way of A5, bonogenemia uh, drugs, glansmans, glandular release disorder in the way of Chediakigashi syndrome, non steroidals, aspirinuremia, abnormal salmonidinal matrix in the way of Marfan syndrome, scurvy, and Ehlers Danlos. Guys, how we can investigate somebody who we think has von Willebrand disease? We need to take a detailed patient and family history. That's of critical importance. Full blood count may reveal thrombocytopenia, but in most instances, platelets are usually normal. Von Willebrand disease should be suspected in patients who have. This is the telltale thing, guys. This is the telltale thing. Uh, they may have prolonged partial thromboplastin time due to the effect of von Willebrand factor deficiency on coagulation factor 8. Remember, von Willebrand is a carrier for factor 8. Without factor 8, it's going to impact your intrinsic pathway and we can end up with prolonged APTT. Or you may have a prolonged bleeding time due to secondary platelet dysfunction. Platelet function is now measured using the platelet function analyzer, also called uh, the platelet function test. Okay, but well, run factor assays will identify the disease in equivocal cases. So if you're not too sure, you can do a ristocetin. Ristocetin sounds like an Italian rice risotto. <laughs> ristocetin cofactor assay, which tests von Willebrand factor function by inducing your von Willebrand factor binding to platelets using the antibiotic ristocetin. And you can also, some uh, labs have the assay to actually measure your von Willebrand factor antigen level. 
vulnerable factor levels may be affected by many conditions, inflammation, pregnancy, oral contraceptives, thyroid status, hyperthyroidism, right, blood type, stress, age, diabetes, malignancy, coagulation factor, eight clotting activity, a functional measurement of factor eight will show decreased activity in patients with the vulnerable blood uh, disease. You can do a multimedic analysis which identifies quantitative abnormalities in vulnerable factor and determine the subtype of disease. Head CT should be obtained in any case of trauma to, to exclude intracranial bleeds, right? Guys, how are we going to manage vulnerable disease? So you want to administer factor eight concentrates as necessary, especially if the patient's going in for surgery. Desmopressin DDAVP induces the release of vulnerable factor from the endothelium. That's beautiful. That's why desmopressin is so important. It is a treatment of choice for most bleeding episodes, causing a two to four fold increase in vulnerable factor and coagulation factor eight levels within 15 to 30 minutes of administration. Brilliant, right? So desmopressin is the treatment of choice for type one where the vulnerable factor is present but reduced. In quantity. Desmopressin has a variable response for type 2 because that's where the vulnerable blood factor is present but abnormal in some way or dysfunctional in some way. Desmopressin is contraindicated for type 2b because it worsens thrombocytopenia and it is ineffective for type 3 where vulnerable blood factor is absent completely. Epistaxis is one of the most common symptoms and can usually be controlled with local pressure and one dose of desmopressin. Menorrhagia may be reduced by the use of oral contraceptives. Patients undergoing minor surgery should be treated with desmopressin prior to the procedure, plus any antifibrinolytic agent. Right? We have trinexamic acid, uh, which is locally available, cyclocapron. We can also use aminocaproic acid for 7 to 10 days afterward. For more severe or bleeding episodes, plasma derived from vulnerable factor concentrate may be administered. All patients should avoid aspirin-containing products. Okay? Prognostication and complication. Type 1 and type 2 of vulnerable disease are subclinical diseases. Clinical manifestations are significantly less severe than those of hemophilia, and the disease generally only becomes a problem during severe trauma or surgery. But type 3 disease, where a vulnerable factor is absento, may be problematic even during menses or minor trauma. Sequelae are similar to those of hemophilia, with joint bleeding and the development of inhibitors after coagulation factor replacement therapy. Bleeding episodes result in significant morbidity, but are somewhat uncommon. Guys, we're coming back to our long stem, right? So this um, lady had basically postpartum hemorrhage, right? Some, some postpartum hemorrhage, she's got posterior hypotension, she's tachycardic, she lost significant blood. APTT slightly prolonged, but platelets are normal. INR 1.1, which is plumb normal. She had a previous episode of bleeding as a child, uh, bleeding from uh, a dental procedure. She has not had hematrosis. She did bruise easily before. She's not taking other meds besides supplements and uh, 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 vitamins. She has no allergies. There is a family history of bleeding after a procedure from her dad. Guys, the answer here is a bonavili brante disease. She has experienced significant bleeding that is primarily mucosal in origin, which is postpartum hemorrhage, prior oral bleeding. This indeed suggests a disorder of primary hemostasis or problems with platelet plug formation, primary hemostasis. Vulvar blood disease is the only disease listed uh, from our options that is a disorder of primary hemostasis. <laughs> My friends, please allow me to encourage you from the Bible. We're taking our scripture today from the Second Timothy, the book of Second Timothy, chapter two, verses fifteen through sixteen. So here, Paul is encouraging the young Timothy, and this is quite a sad letter because this is the last letter that Paul wrote before he was executed, and he's encouraging Timothy to say, "Do your best to present yourself as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth." Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it become more and more ungodly. I pray that we may be able to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And a key part of this is knowing the word of God for yourself through the witness of the Holy Spirit in your life. You never need to be ashamed of the word of God. In fact, you need to be a faithful steward to know how to handle it and how to flesh it out in different situations. Remember, we should always avoid godless chatter and gossiping. Because those who indulge in it become more and more ungodly. The book of Proverbs says that words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's innermost being. Nothing good can ever come from gossiping. If you have nothing good to say about somebody, you'd rather not say it. All right. Guys, here are my references. If you enjoyed this content, I strongly encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much. You can find me on Facebook. Just search for internal medicine, albums, and mnemonics. You can also catch me with snippets on Instagram and on TikTok as well. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. 
we're going to be discussing some very, 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 very interesting topics coming up. Osteoporosis. God bless you.